You're watching The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV, Angela Yee, Charlamagne the God. We are The Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. Matt Barnes. Matt, what's happening, my brother? Man, what's up, fellas? What's going on? I see you looking at your phone. Are you looking at that uh, that meme of you pump faking Kobe Bryant in his face and you still trying to figure out why he didn't flinch? No, that <laughs> shit is almost 10 years old. I'm not looking at that. <laughs> when you have a pillow flight and somebody fakes a pillow at you, don't you at least flinch? Kobe Bryant, that's the play of the game. He didn't even flinch. It's, it resurfaced, It resurfaced though. the last man, couple of nights. It's, it's, it never went to sleep. It's, 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 been, it's been out, man. People still... I'll post some of it on my kids. That's why Kobe didn't flinch. Like, man, what are you talking about? Man? That shit was 2009. What did that What did that do to your mental when you realized he wasn't phased? I think. Uh, I mean, nothing really. I mean, we as competitor. I mean, you know, what I mean, I think that's kind of when I became the villain of the league. Mm -hmm. I think that's when I kind of put the you know the black cape on after that, which wasn't intentional, but it kind of just was what it was. But it was, you know, I ended up a Laker the season after that. So I mean, shit. I guess it worked. Did you ever make him flinch in practice at least? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> now, congratulations on, on your NBA career. Man, appreciate yes. that, you man. You recently retired, and, yeah, and you had a, a great career. Cool run, man. I had a good time, man. It was, you know, not kind of felt like I was on borrowed time. when he was supposed to be there, and, you know, got 14 years, money, and a ring, and, you know, a life I couldn't dream of, man. So it was a blessing. It's interesting with you, too, though, because it always feels like, uh, ba like basketball wasn't bigger than you. Like, some people seem like basketball is their life. Yeah, yeah, that, you, that, yeah that was far from the case. You know, I just really use basketball as a platform, you know, to kind of catapult my, my, my life after basketball and all my business endeavors and, uh, you know, just being, being able to really do what I want to do now. How did you, you know what? enough was enough? Um, when I just woke up one morning and I was just excited for business as I was for, like, a big game. You know what I mean? And then on top of that, you know, I got two twin boys that are nine years old, and as much as they love basketball, they started asking me, you know, Daddy, when you going to start taking us to school? You know what wow. I mean? So it was just kind of bigger, like you said, bigger than basketball. You know, I got 15 years out of it, and, uh, you know, it was time to make a change. Now you going to do the big three? No, nah, I'm done. You I'm done, done with basketball. You done, yeah. done. There's no, nah, no nah. coming back. Like, I, you know, I went out how I wanted to go out. You know, I played plenty, plenty enough, plenty, plenty of time, and, uh, you know, it, now it's just what's next, really. Yeah. At what point do you start thinking about life after basketball? What year in the league do you start? Um, I probably started thinking about, like, once I got, like, 30, 31. Mm -hmm. You know, I was able to play till I was 37. Um, but that's when you really start paying attention in the meetings that, the, you know, the NBA brings people in to talk to you, and that's when you kind of really start paying attention, um, you know, utilizing your resources, meeting people, and, and doing those things to make sure you succeed in the next step. Were you scared of life after basketball? No, not at all. I was excited, to be honest with you. Like I said, I don't, you know, I could still watch it. I've taken my kids to games. Um, I'm probably going to hit a couple of Warrior playoff games when I go back home up to the Bay. So it's, I just knew I made the right decision because I didn't miss it. All right. Now, 420, we, we talk about players smoking weed. Uh huh. Now, now you, you're somebody that smokes weed. We've seen you smoke weed. Yeah. And what do you think about players smoking weed and it being banned from the NBA? And um, I mean, I really don't think it should be banned. I think, uh, you know, we fear what we don't know, you know, whether that's, you know, the, the, marijuana, race, police, like we just fear, we fear the unknown. So I think if people would take time to educate themselves instead of just going off of old notions that we would realize that, you know, it, it's a definitely a, a much better alternative than, you know, popping pills, drinking, smoking cigarettes, you know, taking lean. I mean, weed is, you know, from the earth, it's natural. And most of all, it just calms your ass down. So if I'm a GM or a president of a team, I, you know, I'd much rather have my guys sitting at the house smoking a joint than out in the club popping pills and drinking alcohol all night. Depends what strain it is, though. <laughs> the team will make you want to go run up and down the court all goddamn day, and the girl yeah. calm you down. Yeah, I mean, I was able to run up on up and down the court with both of them, so I was all right. <laughs> now, you let's talk about that because you're doing the 420 project, yeah, which is a new show focused on marijuana and professional sports. Like, like, what, what? How many people were playing ball high? Is what I want to know. Uh, I mean, I can't really speak for other people. Um, you know, I had a, a normal routine where I, on a game day I would go to practice. Uh, you know, I go to shoot around, come home, smoke a joint, take a nap. Uh, wake up, eat, shower, and go to the game. So I don't know if other guys did that. You know, I had some people that said they, you know, they tried it before and tried doing it, but it, you know, it was something that worked for me. So that's what I went with. So you, be, you be playing, you be seeing other players' eyes red, like y'all know y'all high? Uh, not necessarily. Like I said, I think, there's, you know, a big responsibility comes with it, you know, like, you know, like drinking or doing anything else. You just got to understand yourself and understand your body and, and respect, you know, what you have going on. You know, you know, you're representing your team, you're representing an organization, you're representing your teammates. So, you got to be smart about it if you choose to do it. What about drug tests? 
Um, man, I played in the game a long time, so I just, you know, found a way to kind of maneuver. You know, I knew, I, I mean, I wouldn't smoke, smoke like I did in the summer. You know, I would, I would do it accordingly, and I would just know that I, I had to really eat clean and drink a lot of water and, and stay in the steam room to kind of just c- continue to flush my body out. This is how you know Matt ain't even thinking about coming back to the NBA. <laughs> yeah, <It's> not, <laughs> yeah, I know I ain't tripping off though. I'm done. Does it, does, it, does it hurt or help your performance? I think it just allows me to focus better. You know mm. what I mean? I got a, I mean, well documented. My life off the court has been crazy. You know what I mean? So it's just to be able to, we don't ever really get no, get no timeouts when we're players. You know, I lost my mom during my career. I went through a, you know, a well-publicized divorce. I whooped somebody's ass. Put I did, a, on Derek yeah, Fisher, I did yeah, a lot yeah. of different things during my career. So while everyone was saying all this crazy stuff, not really knowing the full truth, you know, I still got to be able to focus on my job and definitely marijuana helped me do that. Do you get tired of hearing that name? No, not yeah. me and Derek. Me and Derek are cool now. Yeah. How, yeah, how did y'all you know get me? cool? I mean, to me, it wasn't. To be cool no, nah, but what happened was that whole situation was, and I explained it to him. It wasn't so much about dating my ex-wife. I didn't agree with it, but you living in the house of my kids and not telling me. Goddamn mm-hmm. right. You mean exactly. so? That's just G code. So once we, you know, squashed that, you know, I talked to him the following summer because they're still together. They live together. So he was always at my kids' games, and I just pulled him to the side and told him exactly what I told you. You know, there's ways to go about it. If you would have came to me at like a man and told me. I wouldn't have liked it, but I wouldn't have respected it. But the yeah. fact you try to sneak around with my kids, and my kids had to tell me is is the reason why this went down. But after that, you know, we've been cool. We was cool before. We was teammates. He was always a cool dude. He just pulled kind of a whatever type move. But <clears throat> to me, if my kids are happy, I'm happy. Nice. You um, you just got the rights to the Huey Newton movie too. Yeah, that's dope. Yeah, we do. Uh, we got about twenty million. I think uh, we got Brian Barber to direct it now, and a whole slew of people. Dr. Dre said he wants to do the score. Um. You know, we got Keith Powers to play Huey. We got a, uh, Wood Harris involved, Hill Harper. We got a lot of cool, you know, people kind of jumping to the stage, uh, hopefully in toss with uh, Beyonce about playing Angela Davis. Um, so it, it's cool, man. It's it's really kind of, you know, pivoted me into my next career, which, you know, I want to produce direct, you know, along with some other things. I didn't realize you was from Oakland. I'm from San Jose. My dad was a drug dealer, so we kind of bounced around a little bit. Then from San Jose... San Jose went to Sacramento, so I was kind of all up and down Northern California. Got you. What what uh what influence did the Panthers have on you? Um, it wasn't so much a, a influence, you know, because I was I wasn't around at that time. But I've always been someone that's been pro people, someone that always spoke out for others, always someone that always tried to do for others. So it was just something that you know, once I kind of studied up on them and realized what they were about, you know, because anytime you hear a black organization or a black people coming together it's always you know there's always negative negative stereotypes about it so when you look into it and read and understand the programs they had it was just something i was very interested in and uh you know when it came came on my table i definitely ran with it now recently we seen you at a, at a rally with uh stefan clark's son and you said you want to ensure he his kids get to college and, and yeah now, now let's talk about that because you know a lot of people stood up for him but you were actually there and it meant yeah. a lot to you Oh uh, yeah, I mean that's you know that's the the streets that you know I grew up on and they, they gave me my toughness and kind of who I am, and I've had several encounters with the you know with the Sacramento PD growing up, so it was just something that touched my heart. And when I first found out about, it, I was actually watching CNN in the morning. You know, I was sending emails. My boys were laying in bed with me on their iPads and it says you know deadly killer or deadly police shooting in Sacramento. So I started paying attention. So me and my twins were watching the whole story, and as soon as the story was over, one of my sons said. Daddy, he got shot 20 times for holding a cell phone. You know, mm. it's a nine-year-old boy telling me this. So it's just like, damn, like, it resonates with them already. And then, you know, coming to find out that, uh, you know, he had two younger sons as well. You know, it was only right for me to, you know, represent my hometown and really make sure I try to ease the financial burden for the family and, and make sure his kids are, are well taken care of. When stuff like that happens, do people say to you, why are you launching a scholarship fund? Pay for it yourself. Uh, I mean, I just, because to me, Paying for myself is an option, but you know I've already talked to his uh, his uh, his ex-wife, and what I want that to do is I want it to grow to something that be nationwide, mm-hmm. to uh, you know, because this is not an isolated situation in Sacramento. I want it to be something that's nationwide for kids who've lost you know fathers to s- similar situations. Now, now, with the movie thing, is the Huey Newton movie just to start? Do you got to wait till that one? Gets done and comes uh, out before you start another. We're rolling one. on another thing, you know. You know my homegirl Polly. She, Polly, uh, yeah, she, 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 oh, Polly. She, she said, "I know Charlemagne's gonna say my name." I said, "You're not that fucking important." But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, you know she's Suge's niece. We just acquired the life rights uh, to the Death Row for, uh, excuse me, to Suge Knight. Okay. So we're gonna do a Death Row series with uh, Mark Kenton, one of the directors from Power. Mm-hmm. And really just lay it all out, man. I mean, Death Row is you know 25 years of of, of of content really and still running, you know, because Suge is still battling for his life. So, um, you know, I think it's something that's going to really change the game. 
Uh, you know, we got one of the biggest directors, you know, from Power. <clears throat> he told me there's only two, you know, seven seasons of Power. And then he basically said our show's on deck. <clears throat> so, um, you know, we've been doing everything we can to. We just acquired the catalogs. So now we got a bunch of amazing music, you know, unheard Pac, unheard, you know, Jay and Pac, like some dope, dope shit. So, um, so Jay and, oh, Dre and Pac or Jay and Jay Pac? Jay and Pac. Really? Yeah. So it's, it's uh, we got some stuff up our sleeve, but, you know, kind of, Stepping out of basketball, these are going to be my first two major projects. And, uh, you know, knock a wood, pray to the man upstairs that they go well because they, they, they can't be monsters. Mm -hmm. Now, how is Matt Barnes staying out of trouble? Because every time I'm around you, you seem like you're such a cool dude, right, but man. things just happen around you It's sometimes. crazy when people finally meet me. They're like, damn, you're not that crazy, motherfucker. We thought you were on the court. And it's just I'm a competitor, you know what I mean? And I came from the streets, and I just happen to look like this. So they think everything is an act. But, like, mm -hmm. my dad was really out there doing it, you know what I mean? So it's just... It's in me, but it's not who I am. And, and it really seems like people kind of say, oh, yeah, yeah, but, like, trouble finds me sometimes, you know? And I'm just not someone that's going to – I'm not good with disrespect. So I kind of just if, – if disrespect happens, that's when I kind of – if I'm not smoking a joint in the next five minutes, something might happen type <laughs> shit. Oh, so, um, you know, I've just been able to stay out the way, though. You know, now I'm not uh, – I'm, I'm between the, the Bay and L.A. and focused on business and spending as much time with my kids as possible, not really out no more, I'm not doing too much, so – you know, just the older me is, is more relaxed and, and just staying out the way, really. And plus not being in the NBA has to change your lifestyle too, though, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, like I said, now I just have more time to do what I'm passionate about outside of playing basketball, which is uh, spending as much time with my kids, um, you know, kind of being an activist and a leader in, in some sense, um, movie projects, you know, other investments. So just, like I said, life after basketball excites me as much as playing basketball did. And what do you do with your kids as far as basketball? Do you, do you encourage them? To Man, play? I'm everything. You know, I don't, I don't push them in any one direction. You know what I mean? Uh, they're very intelligent boys. Um, I think they gravitated to basketball because I was playing basketball, you mm -hmm. know, since they've been born. But, uh, you know, they're, I coach them in football and basketball now. And um, it's just something. I remember when my mom used to scream in the crowd. It used to piss me off and embarrass me because I never understood. Like, Mom, shut the fuck. Why are you screaming so loud? I can hear you out of everybody. But I, I'm not a screamer now, but now I understand the excitement of just seeing your kids succeed in Absolutely. something. Like, there's nothing better to me. Like, it's more exciting to watch my kids play basketball than me to, you know, the excitement I have from playing basketball. Do you feel like uh, you have to cut certain people off in your life to stay out of trouble, like like Polly? <sighs> no, no, definitely like, not. Polly, that. No. Polly alone, man. She, she's, a, she's, a, she's, a, you know, she's, she's someone that's come a long way, man. We met on some authentic shit about five years ago, and I just saw the light in her, man. And she has a bad reputation and a bad past, but she's a great person. Great person. You know, you know her. You know, so I just, she's, I call her, you know, my third child, even though she's older than me, you know, just been kind of living off each other and, and trying to better each other and help her get her life back on track, which is, which has been amazing to see. And, uh, but for the most part, I've had the same friends, man, since I was younger, you know, since I was high, junior high, high school, you know, a, a few college teammates, I kick it with a couple of dudes in the pros, I kick it with. So my circle's always really been pretty small. So any trouble you see me getting into, it's because of me, not nobody else. Right. Now let's talk about the NBA a little bit. Does the NBA, NBA seem like it got softer? Soft as fuck, right? Right. It's crazy. It's just, I understand it though. You know, you gotta you gotta conform or get left behind. And, and now it's all about scoring. You know what I mean? They know the more points, the more threes, the more dunks, the higher the ratings are. So it really takes away from someone like myself who was a dog and, and played defense and enjoying locking people down because now you can't guard nobody without it. You know, being a foul. So. From someone that was passionate and loved the game, that standpoint, I grew up in the 80s, like y'all watching, you know, the Lakers and, and the Bulls and the Pistons and the Knicks and that kind of shit. So to see what the game's come to now, as a purist, um, it's a little frustrating. But like I said, I understand the movement and where they're trying to go and how revenue streams increase when, you know, the Warriors are scoring 130 a night. Now, what do you think about the super teams in the league now? Um, it, like I said, it, it's another part of the, you just got to conform. You know, it would have definitely never would have happened in the 80s. But then at the same time, the reason why I love it is because the league is so cutthroat with, with the with the business side of it. I mean, we get cut, traded, released, benched, and it's the business. You know, someone like LeBron or KD want to take their future in their own hands, take less money to win, and they're they're the villain. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it, it's really a crazy double standard, which I completely disagree with. So I'm not so much for the super teams, but I'm I'm all for people empowering themselves and doing what they want to do with their career. You played for one, though. No? Yeah, I did. Golden State. I was cool with it, man. Yeah. Like I said, it was it, it was cool. It was a cool ride, and and that team was so special because you got the you got four all stars on that team plus sort of a rock star coach, and there's absolutely no egos. Everybody knows the common goal is to win. There's no arguing. There's no bickering. There's no bullshit. Like every night they go out there, it's it's, it's all about winning. I don't mind the Warriors though because most they did it through the draft, other than 
KD. Right. You know what I mean? Right. No, it's, like I said, it's it's you know KD made a tough decision, and you know it was something I talked to him about the whole time because he was in OKC and I was with the Clippers, and we, you know we're real cool. I was just like, he's like, you know, I'm thinking about going to the Warriors. I'm like, shit, I'm I'm from there. I'm always trying to go to the Warriors. So we were both free agents at the time. You know, he ends up signing this deal. Um, and takes a lot of money, which doesn't leave me no money. But then I go to Sacramento, get some money, and then end up in Golden State with him anyway. So it was a dope situation. <clears throat> KD's a great dude. You know, someone that's very, I think, misunderstood. Gets a bad rap, but a really down-to-earth cool dude. Did he pull any strings to get you to Golden State? Uh, I think, you know, once they found out that, that DeMarcus Cousins stuff went down and I was free, you know, I know him and uh, Draymond, Clay, um, all put in a good word for me. And then knowing Coach Kerr for a while, um, it was kind of a seamless transition. Dope. Who wins this year? That's tough, man. I think um, I think whoever comes out of the West wins. <clears throat> I think it'll be Houston and Golden State in the Western Conference Finals, um, and, and really anybody can win that. They're going to need a, a – both teams are going to be fully healthy. Steph's going to be need to be healthy and on his game. But to me, and this all due respect to the Eastern Conference, I think the real finals will be the Western Conference Finals. Okay. And who's the MVP <laughs> this year? Is it is – it- Man, that's hard. I would do a co-MVP, man, for what LeBron has done at his age and been able to carry that team, you know, because, uh, you know, they're not as talented as they've been in the, <clears throat> been in the past. And the numbers he's put up at, at, what, 15 years in the league. And then, I mean, what Harden's been doing is is sick. You he's know, got man, better he's numbers sick. than Harden. Yo, yeah. But then even Westbrook. Westbrook got the triple-double and, and, again and, this year. Like, and, and Westbrook is a monster. Damn. You know what I mean? So someone's going to get the short end of the stick. I mean, I don't, I don't know if they've ever done co-MVP, but if they have, this would be the year to uh, definitely have a co-MVP. Would you do commentating? That's what you... uh, eventually. There's just so many other cool things I'm into right now. Um, you know, I kind of want to keep my face fresh, so I do some ESPN stuff here to there, uh, here and there. Um, but for the most part, you know, I'm just enjoying what, what, what life has put in front of me right now. And with pushing stuff for Bleach Report, with this cannabis stuff, you know, this social activism stuff I've been doing in Sacramento, you know, I eventually want to go back and be the mayor there in about 10 or 15 years once everything slows down. So I'm just enjoying stuff outside of sports as a whole right now. All right. All right. Well, we appreciate you for joining us this morning. Man, Did thank you smoke you. yet for 420? No, I just landed. I just uh, I just landed. But as soon as I leave, I'm going to try to. But, uh, yeah, make sure you check out this, uh, you know, BR 420 on all Bleach Report platforms today. It's really going to open your eyes on – just the way you think about athletes and marijuana and probably surprise you because, you know, a lot of your favorite athletes smoke weed and and it's not a bad thing. All right. Well, there you have it. It's Matt Barnes. It's the Breakfast Club. Good morning.